Good evening to everybody and uh, <clears throat> welcome back if you were here last week to the uh, second week of introducing Buddhism and if you weren't here last week uh, welcome for the first time. Um, there's been a, a, the slides and the video are now um, available to see there was a bit of a delay with those, but <clears throat> they are there now. Um, so if you do miss a lesson, you can um, go back and catch up because the lessons, as I said before, will uh, build on one another. Um, OK, so I think as it's nearly 25 to, we will uh, start. Um, and I thought this evening we would just take a few minutes to uh, arrive here with uh, what we are uh, doing now. It's a, a chance to declutch from whatever your previous activities were before you logged on. Some of you may have been running around trying to make this 6.30 deadline, or some of you might have had a very lazy day and feel a bit uh, dopey, a bit tired, whatever, we are now into reborn into a new situation. So um, we're going to just take a minute or two just to connect with our, our bodies and our, our breath. So perhaps you could make sure that you're, you're sitting comfortably and that you're feeling relaxed. And then if you take just a few deep uh, breaths and connect with that physical sensation of breathing. So we're not thinking about the breathing, but we're actually connecting to the, to the, to the feeling, that sensation of breathing. Feel the body, maybe feel your feet on the floor, your bottom on the seat. Clothes uh, touching your skin. What's the mood? Do you feel rushed or do you feel very relaxed? So we're just directing our awareness and we're bringing ourselves here and now into the body and into uh, the activity that we are doing now. Um, just one thing, Lavinia, is it possible to uh, remove my self-image so I'm not looking at myself? Um, you'll have to do it yourself and change your view and put it to gallery view. Put so it to gallery view. Yeah. So you can see other people. Yeah. And aha, uh -huh, I can hide self view. It's very disconcerting that you can just see yourself <laughs> talking back at yourself. It's not normally <laughs> um, what happens, is it? Um, so. Before I share my slides, let's have a, a chat about uh, the homework uh, I suggested that you did. Uh, if you get a chance at the uh, sometime before the following Monday, if you can have a mull over uh, at the, um, the lesson content that we've looked at. But I also asked that to sit for five, 10 minutes uh, in a, an armchair, in a relaxed armchair, and just sit. No distractions, no reading, no TV, no radio, no smartphone, and just to sit. I don't know if anybody tried that. Would anybody like to just show their hand if they did? One or two, brilliant, brilliant. 
And as I said, when I do this, my, my greatest difficulty is, is my smartphone. Um, has somebody just text me? Is there an email? And if there isn't, let me look on the uh, news website or whatever. We uh, find it very difficult to just sit still. I'm going to ask you to do something similar again at the end of, of this week. So if you didn't do it, please do it uh, this time. And if you did. Thank you. And try it again. OK, so I'm now going to share uh, the screen with you. So we have just had a look at the homework and let's move on. So this week, lesson two, we're looking at the three signs of being and the three fires. Bit of a summary from last week, not simply because some people may not have been here last week, but we're doing it just to get ourselves back into the frame of mind and what we were talking about. So from last week, if I had to sum up the Buddha's teachings in one sentence, the Buddha summed it up as, I teach one thing and one thing only, suffering and the end of suffering. And that suffering is, the word is a translation from uh, the Pali or Sanskrit word, uh, dukkha, which can mean anything from being um, restless to being sort of dissatisfied. Um, so suffering really isn't perhaps the best uh, translation. It's important we keep this in our minds, that the Buddha, his teachings are about Dukkha. This was his concern. And next I have a sentence, and this is from uh, Lama Surudas, and it says, it is the nature of life that all beings will face difficulties. Through enlightened living, one can transcend these difficulties. So we've just got a rewording of the Buddha's uh, teaching. I've put in bold, enlightened. I think we sometimes the word enlightenment or enlightenment is used a lot and I'm not sure we're, we can always agree what we mean by that. But for me here, he is talking about living with clear seeing, with wisdom. And if we can do that, then we can transcend these difficulties. And this is what the Buddhist training is, is and the teachings are doing, guiding us towards And a quote from one of the sutras. In this very one fathom long body, along with its perceptions and thoughts, do I proclaim the world, the origin of the world, the cessation of the world, the path leading to the cessation of the world. Let's remind ourselves that the Buddha was a man, a mortal man, a human being. He was not a god. And he is saying here that in this body, your body, then with your perception, with your thoughts, with your intellect, you can, the cessation of the world and the path leading to the cessation of the world, and that is the world of suffering, with your own efforts. And the Buddha made that very, uh, very clear for us. So let's carry on with those things uh, in mind. So the Buddha is known as a physician. He was a, called the great healer. And like a doctor, he made a diagnosis. And the diagnosis was that there is the truth of suffering for all of us. This is, this is something shared. It isn't just one of us that has difficulties. We all do. The truth of origination, there is a cause for this suffering. And there is a cure. And there is treatment, the path. 
So those are the four noble truths, and we will do look at those in a lot more detail next week. But underneath it says the diagnosis is drastic. It is serious. We, we struggle. And at the moment, for various reasons, possibly with COVID, uh, I don't know, but a lot of people are struggling. So this is very real for us. These teachings might be nearly 3,000 years old, but they speak to us very much now. And then underneath it said, all conditioned existence has the nature of suffering. And hopefully this lesson will uh, make clear what that is referring to. And also on his deathbed, the Buddha said, impermanent are all compounded things. Strive on heedfully. Be careful. And again, uh, what he meant by that should become clearer. So we're looking at the three signs of being and the three fires this evening. And they are one of many numerical discourses of the Buddha's teachings. There are lots of numbers five of this, six of the other, seven uh, factors of enlightenment, five hindrances. There are lots of them. Buddhism, the teachings, they're wonderfully categorized and itemized, the systematic. And this helps us to remember them as it did back then when before teachings were written down. But it helps us to uh, have something to work with. We're very clear what we are looking at. However, the danger is that if we're not careful, we just get to know them off by heart and we can quote them at people. But that's not the point of them. They're actually uh, practice uh, formulations. They are to be investigated are they helpful to you do they apply to you are they relevant to you and we apply the threefold wisdom of when we're listening to spiritual teachings we listen or read uh, we ponder in the heart and then we practice in the body And by that, it means that in some way, they may be result in a change of attitude, which may result in a change of things that we do or, or don't do. So that's what we do with them, which is why uh, also at the end of the week, if you can have a chance to look at some of these, um, even if it's just for a few moments, uh, just to, to ponder. At the end of last week, I give the analogy, a story about a sieve. If we're not careful, these teachings just go in one ear and out of the other, but they're actually meant to be worked with. So um, I was reminded last week um, about the website, Access to Insight. And if you are interested, um, if you put in any of these things into the search on that website, it will take you straight to a translation of the, of the sutras. So you're actually getting the, the Buddha's words, albeit a translation, but you are getting uh, closer to what uh, the Buddha actually said. So some of you might find that uh, interesting to do. It is interesting to do. <clears throat> Okay, three signs of being or three marks of existence. Anything, any phenomena, any physical object, any thought, any emotion, any ideas, any phenomena. The Buddha said everything has these three signs or three marks. So this teaching is not to be debated. Was he right? Was he wrong? 
but just to explore and to see if it's helpful or if it's relevant to you. And number one says, all things are impermanent, subject to change. And uh, the Pali or Sanskrit word there is anicca. All things are impermanent, everything. He says there is nothing that stays the same. Even mountains over a millennium will change. We know this. And particularly now modern science is telling us this. But we know it anyway. So if anybody buys me a bunch of red roses, I know that they will wilt and they will lose their colour and they will lose their, their texture and I'll eventually have to throw them away. I might be a little bit sad, especially if they were bought for me for a special occasion, but I'm not surprised. And it would really be a bit foolish of me to get myself very distressed about something that I can't change and I know is actually going to happen. So some aspects of impermanence we're, we're okay with. We accept it because we know. We know that it will happen. We know, uh, like, for example, the weather changes. Our bodies, we know they are aging. We know this. We can see it in other people. We can see it in ourselves. We can look back at photographs and know that we don't look the same as we did 10 years ago. We know this, but actually that can make us feel uncomfortable. And certainly in the culture uh, that we live in where um, youth and beauty are valued more than, than age and experience, it can make, us, can make us upset. We don't like to grow old, and yet we know it's, it's going to happen. And so much so, people have Botox or um, things lifted up and tightened or whatever to try and make ourselves look younger. So impermanence can make us feel uncomfortable. And in fact, life is uncertain because everything changes. Situations change. People leave us. We lose jobs. We get made redundant. Um, and it's understandable that these things make us feel um, anxious. But Buddhism is asking us to have a look at uh, that dukkha. And actually, impermanence isn't uh, always a bad thing. It isn't a bad thing. If, if things didn't change, if everything was permanent, then there would be nothing new and a difficult situation wouldn't change. And there wouldn't be possibilities of uh, new things arising. The Buddha never said that we don't have happy moments. We do. But happy moments can be unsatisfactory because they change and cease to exist. Um, in January, I can't remember the date, but there's a day in January when apparently lots of people feel depressed because Christmas, all the excitement of Christmas is gone. And now we're left with just January. There's an ancient Sufi folktale. And uh, a king was tired of being uh, on an emotional seesaw, you know, elated by some things and uh, depressed by other situations. And he was tired. He wanted a little bit more balance, a little bit more equanimity. So he assembled his, his wise men together and asked them to make him something that would raise him when he was depressed and calm him when he was excited. So they went away and meditated for a long time and thought about it and came back to him, having made just a, a plain uh, gold ring. And at first the king was annoyed. Like, is that it? Is that all you're going to give me? Uh, just before he uh, was about to cut their heads off, uh, they said to him, look inside, it's got an inscription. And inscribed inside the ring was, this too shall pass. And on their advice, the king wore that ring uh, every day. 
And if he felt depressed and low about a situation, he would look at the inscription, this too shall pass. And it would help him because he knew the situation would change. Also, though, when he was feeling very cheerful and maybe happy about something, to look again. Now, this is the real trick, isn't it? Would we remember to look in the ring when we were happy? Uh, we probably wouldn't. But if he did, this too shall pass. That's not to depress us when we're in a nice, happy situation, but it's a, a potent reminder to help us to value and live life to the full, to value what we have at this moment. Because we have sometimes a tendency to always hanker after uh, something else. So why are things impermanent? Why do they change? Well, this brings us to anatta. And anatta is explaining impermanency. And the reason that everything is impermanent, all phenomena is impermanent, is because there is nothing inherently self about it. There is a lack of any self nature. Nothing exists of itself from its own side. Everything is subject to causes and conditions. Everything arises due to causes and conditions. And when those causes and conditions change, then whatever it was changes as well. Very simple analogy, very simple example, the fire triangle. For fire, we need oxygen, heat and a fuel. Fire is a compounded Thing. When we label things, we make them solid for ourselves. And actually, they're not. And, and again, science is now telling us this. So that fire, if we remove one of those parts, will either go out or go less. If we change, give less oxygen or less fuel, so the fire is compounded de depending on those other conditions. And the Buddha said, this is true of everything. Nothing exists of itself. So the three signs of being are the three marks of existence. And each are impermanence. Things are constantly changing. They cause suffering, they cause us discomfort. Things change, they are impermanent because they are conditioned. They are empty of any self-nature. Now, it's not usual to look at the three signs of existence as a, a flow chart like that. They're usually written uh, as a list. So the three of them, Anicca, Anatta, and Dukkha. And actually, there is a fourth one that belongs with these, and that is Nibbana or Nirvana, which actually, for here we're going to say, means peace, contentment. So despite those three things, the Buddha's teachings are telling us that actually the Dukkha can be uh, relieved. We don't have to have the dukkha. We can have peace and contentment with understanding. These are called the four seals of Buddhism when you get the four of them together like that. And it said, if you fully understand and see this and live this, then that is really what it is meant to be uh, a Buddhist. A verse from the Dharmapada. Look at this glittering world, like a royal carriage. That seems very appropriate at the moment. I was just watching that before I, I came onto Zoom. Um, the royal carriage. The immature are taken up by it, but the wise do not cling to it. 
we're very much attracted to, to things, external things, things out there. And that, that's okay. But what happens when these things die, change, break, we lose them? The wise can accept that misfortune because they can see more clearly. It goes back in a way to talking about the fact we get upset that this body ages and is less attractive and becomes older and uh, more in, infirm. And yet we, we know this. What about us? Do we change? Is there a permanent me, a permanent I? Well, we do know our body changes. But is there something inside this body that is permanent, that is me, that is all whim? Well, the Buddha asked us to investigate this. And for practice purposes, for investigation, the Buddha talked about the five skandhas or aggregates or heaps. And hopefully they will become clearer to you as we go on. As an example, the Buddha used a chariot. He used a chariot because that's what people were familiar with. And the Buddha did that often. He tried to take practical, familiar examples uh, to get across his point. And um, you'll see that in others of his teachers, and we try to do that also. So the Buddha chose a chariot, and that is a chariot. Is it? Where, where's the chariot? The chariot is actually not one thing, is it? It's made up of different parts. Together they are the chariot, but on their own, where is the chariot? Well, I decided that we would actually look at something more familiar to us, a, a car. Is this a car? That's an empty body of a car. Here are all the parts of the car. So no, it's not a car, is it? It's a collection of car parts. Which bit is the car? You might say, well, it's that bit there. Well, it, that's not a car. That body of the car isn't the car. It's no use to me. I can't sit in it. The car seats aren't in. It's got no wheels and it's got no engine. That is not a car. So to be a car, all these parts have to be assembled together to make a functioning car. So the car doesn't exist of itself. The car is simply various chosen parts put together. But when they are all put together, they work very well together. They smoothly, fun smoothly function as a car. And equally, that car can be broken up and disappear again and become back into its uh, components. And indeed, that will happen to every car. So if I go and buy myself a very expensive car that I'm absolutely thrilled to bits with, which I would because I like cars, but if I did that, then ultimately that car that's taken a lot of my money would end up in bits again at some point. So it's conditioned, it's compounded. So if we come back to us, what about us? Do we change or is there a permanent eye? So the Buddha talked about five skandhas or parts, and he said there were five of them. I'm just going to show you the five, then we'll just unpick them a little bit. So first of all, we've got the physical body, rupa. We've got a sensation or feeling, vedana. We've got perception, sana, volitional factors, sankara, and consciousness, vinana or vijana. Let's have a look at them in a little bit more detail. We've already talked about the body. 
we know the body changes. So there is no I, Olwyn, is not this body. It, we don't treat it like that. I spend a lot of time showering it and having its hair cut and everything. But actually, I am not this body. People have um, organ transplants, don't they? They have new hearts and things. Um, are they somebody different if that happens? If, if, if I lose a limb, am I no longer me? Some people have had to have face transplants. That must be very bizarre to look like somebody different, but are you somebody different? And this body, this physical body, it, uh, receives sensory data input from outside. We have the five senses, touch, taste, smell, sight, sound. In Buddhism, though, we have six senses. We have the sense of thought. So as the eye is the organ for sight, the mind is the organ for thought. What do we do with senses? We detect them. And we, in some way, uh, can res respond to them. And we can, we can do that with our thoughts. We are aware of thoughts. That sensory data produces a reaction, in, a, a sensation. It's been translated as feeling, but that is confusing, I think, because we, we use the word generally feeling to mean I feel angry, I feel tired. This isn't talking about that kind of feeling. So Vedana, um, it's nice sometimes to stick with the original words where there's any real confusion. So this is a response to sense data. And the Buddha said it's usually a liking, a finding something pleasant, a disliking, or finding something unpleasant, or neutral in that we're not interested. For example, I park my car, and I go back, walking back to my parked car, and I can see uh, underneath the windscreen wiper, on the windscreen, is uh, something in a plastic envelope. Before any thinking, before any thinking, there will be a reaction that if I'm quite body aware, I may well feel in the body. I said, like, mm, bet that's a parking ticket. Which brings us to number three, perception. We recognize objects, we label things, not just objects, we label emotions, we, we label ideas. We've just been talking about labeling, it's extremely useful. Life would be very difficult if we didn't do it. However, um, sometimes that labeling can be um, misleading. But we can label and we can recognize something and that includes memory. So if I walk back, I can I walk up to my car, I can recognize it's a parking ticket. Um, and that's because I've had one before. So I know what they look like. Somebody, uh, for example, uh, my granddaughter wouldn't recognize a parking ticket stuck on my car because she's got no experience of them. So it depends on experience. And then we come to number four, volitional factors, sankara. Mental configurations, the thought streams. And so I get a parking ticket and I would start confecting or making up thought streams, probably along the lines of, where did it tell me I couldn't park here? Or, goodness me, I'm only two minutes old. Read a thought that have given me a few minutes before this happened with a, a parking ticket. And we can get all sorts of uh fantasies and opinions these things change the data that's coming in is constantly changing the sensations that i get do i like it do i dislike it is it pleasant is it unpleasant perception changes as we've just said it it's very much an experience or a cultural thing 
I like, um, if I go into a folk museum, a local history museum, I, I like the bits where they have these quizzes and they show you these objects and they say, from, you know, like from a medieval kitchen or something, what is this? What did they use it for? And you stand and you look at it and you turn it upside down and you don't know because you've got no experience of it. So perception uh, changes over time. Volitional factors, sankara, volitional means that whether we are aware of it or not, there is a choice. Am I helping the situation if I go on and on about how much I hate traffic wardens, for example? Does that take away the parking ticket? And all of this is going on in consciousness. That is what we are aware of what we are conscious of. What is this? Okay, well, some of you might be saying it's just a dish, uh, a metal dish, and maybe a brass, bronze, gold dish or a bowl. Some of you might be thinking that because you're on a, an introducing Buddhist course, it's a Tibetan gong. And if I give you a little more clue, and there you've got the striker, and there you've got the cushion to put it on, that is what it is, the Tibetan gong. Now, if we were all in the same room, we might have argued about it. No, it's this. No, it's not. No, it's the other. And we might have tried to persuade others to uh, agree with us. And if you were correct, you might be feeling quite smug and superior to those who got it wrong and those others might be feeling inferior. All this is done through consciousness. And consciousness is a, a function that we have for being born into a human body. So when a baby is born, it has a physical body, it has rupa, and it also has uh, consciousness. Um, it's a conscious being, it has vedana, it has sensations, it feels pleasure, it feels pain. Um, that's why they cry or coo at us. On the other hand, perception and mental formations, sana and sankara, are actually, they, they've come about through uh, cultural conditioning. You're not born with perception and mental formations. They come about later as you acquire language and you begin to perceive yourself as um, being a certain type of person, belonging to a certain group, a certain nationality. Um, and, th and these are acquired like em emotional habits. But there is no unchanging you. That is not to say you are not here. That's silly. And it's also not to say that you are not an individual. You are. There is a me, there is a you, we are different, we are not the same, but there is nothing that is permanent. Is there a triangle there in that image? There is an illusion of a triangle, and I only know that because I'm familiar with the triangle. I know the shape triangle, but there is actually no triangle there. But because of experience uh, in my, our consciousness, I can see, I think there's a triangle there. It's an illusion. There is no triangle. We feel, it feels very strongly that there is an I, something inside that is unchanging. But actually, the Buddha said, that is a delusion, a delusion because it's unhelpful. It causes dukkha. We are not what we think. But a ghost, uh, 
fifth century Indian Buddhist philosopher said, mere suffering exists, but no sufferer is found. The deeds are, but no doer is found. There is no thinker behind the thoughts. If you remove the thoughts, there is no thinker. This is in direct opposition to perhaps what we think from the Cartesian, I think, therefore I am. There is no permanent I. The whole process, like a car being put together with those components, functions very smoothly without anybody in charge. And let's just unpick that a minute. Who, who digests your food? How do you digest your food? You can you put it in your mouth. Uh, so there's an art, you, you know, you can choose to put something and eat something, but you, you have nothing to do with that then being digested. Who breathes when you are asleep? Who pulls the duvet back on if it falls off and it's a cold night? Presumably not your mum. Who can pull that duvet cover back over you? Who does that? If you bump into a friend out in the supermarket unexpectedly, you haven't planned the conversation and yet you can function in a conversation. There is no need for this I controlling and manipulating everything. You are a process that functions very, very well without that. So interested in where this no sense of I comes from. And actually, I'm just going to stop a minute because I've forgotten to say, um, oh, you've had a chat to say if you want to ask a question, put them in the chat or I put up your hand. Right. Sorry. Let's go back. <clears throat> this sense of I is sometimes very strong. And other times it's not there at all. For example, if you were watching a, a film or reading a really good book or doing a hobby, that sense of I, me, it isn't there. That sense of I is there when we are um, liking something or disliking something or judging or comparing things. So this I is part of the reason that there is Dukkha, this belief in this I, me, mine, this self-cherishing uh, I. And all this is compounded by uh, what are called the three fires or the three root uh, poisons. So, as we're saying, this, bo this body functions well without this delusion of I, this sense of me and mine. And this is compounded by this energy from the three fires or root poisons. The first one is represented pictorially by a, a wild boar because they uh, kick up, they dig in the dirt and they kick it up and throw it in the face and uh, blind themselves. So it is a wrong view. It's a delusion. It's harmful. The cockerel represents the fact that we're always wanting something. It's never enough. And the snake represents the fact that ill will, hatred, or not wanting something. And actually, they're just the opposites of each other, they're the, the same thing. It'd be very interesting in the week for you to uh, 
have a thought, think about this I, when, when do you feel very strongly me? And do you notice that the wanting, that was part of the task of sitting in the armchair. Did you notice the wanting, wanting to move or wanting something or actually disliking what you were doing? Our life is not satisfying that with, there's always this, that there is something out there that I've got to get, or there is something out there that I really do not want and I, and I push it away. It could be a situation. It's not necessarily a physical object. But there's a conventional way of speaking that's useful, but it's only relatively true. Um, for example, I have got a garden. Attached to this house is a garden. And I can call it my garden. So we said, this is mine, this is me, and it's my garden. But actually, my house is nearly 200 years old. It's, the garden comes with the house. People have lived here and died here before, and it's been their garden. It's not really my garden. And yet it is my garden because, you know, it's there on the deeds of the house and my name's on the house. And... Uh, if some people decided, people I didn't know, to come and have a picnic in it, I'd be justifiably quite annoyed. And I could phone up the police and say I had intruders. Whether they'd come or not, don't know. But I could phone them up and justifiably say there are intruders in my garden. So it is my garden, but at the same time, it isn't my garden. So when we talk about I and me and mine, then, then it, it's justifiable but it's not the whole truth. There's all animals in my garden. There's the birds and the squirrels. Do they know it is my garden? Because if I said to them, don't come in, it's my garden, I think I'd be wasting my, my breath. So we get angry, we get upset about things. And actually these feelings are outside our control. I can't choose to get angry. I don't choose to get angry. Um, and all that we are being asked to do is just to be aware, just to know them. And just to finish with the parable of uh, the rope. Very famous story from the Buddha that's extremely profound and in, in so many ways. But um, a, a man is walking in India along a mountain path at dusk. And he comes across what he thinks is a snake in the road. And he thinks he's quite frightened. He's on his own. Am I going to get past this snake? And a voice says, the Buddha says, look again. And he looks and he looks more carefully in the dusk and realizes it's not a snake. It's just a rope. And there's nothing to be frightened of. And then the Buddha said, but look again. And he looks again. And this time, what he sees is it's not a rope, it's um, a string of pearls, something very valuable. So what he saw, what he thought he saw, the perception was not correct. Why did he think it was a snake? Well, maybe, you know, because it's dusk and it's India where you get snakes and somebody said to him, there are snakes on that road, be careful. So, you know, the thoughts were already set. How is this relevant to us now? You're thinking, I'm not going walking anywhere on a path where there might be some snakes. But all the time we are, with our eyes, we see something. And then our perception says it's something that we don't like or do like. For example, you might come home uh, to, uh, if, if you live with somebody, to a, a spouse or a partner, and, and you come home and they don't seem to greet you with the enthusiasm that you would like. So you say, what's the matter? What have I done again? Why are you, be, why are you moody? And actually, they've got something of their own going on. That's the snake that turns it into a me, a mine, and an I. Often when people are occurred with us, it has nothing to do with us. I've had a, a few instances where my texts have been misconstrued and I've done that to other texts uh, that have come to me where it's very easy uh, to do that. Okay. This time with the armchair activity, decide a time to sit. 
So choose a time in the day and decide how long to sit. Between 10 to 15 minutes. Again, no distractions. What is in awareness? What sights and sounds? What thoughts? But try not to talk about it, just to have that awareness. Don't sit there and get yourself all stressed. That's not the purpose. Keep it relaxed. Um, and it's interesting when the time comes, how do you feel about it? Just, just have a, a look at increasing your awareness. Okay, thank you. We'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Good evening, Owen. Thank you so much for this class. I can't see any question in the chat at the moment, but I'm sure people are sending questions over. And you can also uh, raise your virtual hand and we will let you mute if you would like to directly ask the question. Thank you. Okay, I see a question just arrived in the chat. And it's asking, what is the middle passage? The middle way? Where, where, where did the question come from? Is it the middle way, they mean? I think so. It's, it's just asking, what is the middle passage? Um, are you assuming you're talking about the middle way, uh, we're going to talk more about that when we look at the uh, next week. And Yes, sorry about that. It's uh, from the last session, uh, the previous lady, she was speaking about the middle way, the middle passage, and I really wanted to understand that. It's in between uh, live in abundance and between suffering. So the middle way, which, as I said, we will talk about more um, so we go back to the Buddha's life story. He um, lived a life of luxury and um, that didn't give him the answers to uh, the problems that he felt that we faced. And then he went to the opposite extreme and, and uh, lived a life of severe austere practices, nearly dying. And, it, and he, in, the, in his first sermon that we will refer to next week, he said, it's that neither too much luxury, too many nice good things or not, neither are helpful. We need to be somewhere in the middle. But actually, the middle way is um, very profound teaching because we tend to um, think in opposites of things, light, dark, good, bad. And actually, the middle way is asking us to, to look at all sides and uh, to get a balanced approach. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Owen. The next question, oh, sorry, is asking, uh, sorry, that's just a comment, uh, that says that portion about perception is spot on as everything externally gets processed through us internally with all our previous experiences. Absolutely, yes. And then we do have another comment that says, the snake resonates with me. I see problems where there aren't, I think. How can I change that? I've been bereaved, and so I am predisposed to feel people have bad motives at the moment. I am aware that my perceptions are playing tricks on me, but it doesn't stop those perceptions from feel, uh, feeling real and causing me suffering. Um, I wonder how I, ch I can change that suffering due to misperception. 
for example, my friend isn't supporting me in grief. They are a bad person. They have let me down. I know this isn't true, but I still feel it. That's interesting because uh, we were looking at the three uh, root poisons and one of them is this ill will, hatred and that we all experience. And the fact that it is being brought into awareness and that we recognise it is the key. It doesn't mean that it completely disappears and it keeps coming back, but the fact that there is awareness and by just holding these things in awareness and not getting tangled up with the thought streams, um, it becomes a lot clearer. And, it, and it's, it's practice. It can, it can take a, a, a long time. But I have similar problems about situations where, you know, I begin to think that very negative things about somebody and a situation – but with awareness, I, I, well, at least if I know that that is what is happening. So awareness is the key. Thank you so much, Owen. I do not have any more questions in the chat for the moment. Um, I don't know if... Anybody else? Oh, just one just came in and it is asking what causes emotion? Emotions come from that sense of I, me, mine. And the, the three root poisons, the three fires are the, the basis from those emotions come all the others that we can label like jealousy. Um, can't think of another emotion, but all the other emotions come from those. Uh, can I think of one? Jealousy. However, those were, we're going to actually, can't think which week it is, but when we do the Wheel of Life, uh, is that week six or seven? I haven't got the... the visible but we will look at that in a lot more detail so yes good question thank you so much for that so i do not have any more questions oh another <laughs> sorry do we have time for one more question it's 8 30 Yes, just one more question, okay. yeah. yeah. That's perfect. All right. This question is asking, some philosophies talk about the I being the sense of awareness, not the thoughts, but the awareness of thoughts. Is that then not what Buddhism teaches? What is the sense of awareness? Where does it get categorized? Uh, awareness is there because we are alive. That, that is the awareness. A dead person has no awareness. I and no I are terms used uh, in, in, in Buddhism and hopefully they, they will become clearer over uh, the next few weeks. But... I is a sense that we have, that we have to control uh, uh, things and get things. And actually, Buddhism is saying that that's a, a, a delusion. There is no I. You function just as it is appropriately. And actually, the sense of I, me, mine uh, gets in the way. This is not to say, I'm repeating myself, I know I am, but I think this is quite important, that this does not mean that you do not exist. It's not saying you're not here. And all these things to be investigated with a light touch. You know, we can get ourselves a bit all tangled up if we aren't careful. 
So this is a, a light touch. And if it began to make you panicky or made you feel like you, you, you didn't exist, then just drop it. Thank you so much. Thanks okay. a lot for this class. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much um, for uh, coming. And please try the homework. And hopefully, uh, I will see you at the same time next week. <laughs>